welcome to an online lecture with University of Gothenburg's Network for Critical Animal Studies in the Anthropocene, also known as GUCAS. We are a cross-disciplinary network for critical animal studies, animal rights and sustainability. And we aim to create a platform for knowledge production, exchange and collaboration where people from different parts of university, from social movements and civil society can come together. And today's lecture is part of our seminar series that is founded by Gustav Adolf Bratz Foundation. Today we will listen to a talk by author, cultural columnist and debater Lisa Golmark. And Golmark is a pioneer within the field of critical animal studies and she has paved the way, especially for many of us in the Swedish context. In her work, Goldmark emphasizes the struggle against speciesism as aligned with the struggle against sexism, racism, ageism and other forms of discrimination, including the destruction of nature and climate. Goldmark is the author of several books such as Animal Rights, A Question of Freedom, Equality and Solidarity from 1998 and Beauties and Beasts, a feminist critique of the animal-human relationship from 2005. As a researcher of parallel history, she has contributed to biographies on early animal rights advocates and vegetarians. Her latest book is Rosewater of the Revolution. And personally, Lisa Goldmark has been a huge inspiration for me, and her book Beauties and Beasts was one of the first feminist writings on human-animal relations that I ever read. And reading this book as an undergraduate student, it brilliantly put into words connections between different forms of oppressions I might have started to see but not articulated so clearly. And to have someone put into words your not yet finished thoughts is a very special feeling. It also enabled me to make new connections that I did not make prior to reading the book. It enabled me to see the relationship between the animal and the human more clearly. So in her work, Goldmark makes crucial connections graspable. And we're very happy to have her as a guest lecturer in the seminar series of the GUCAST network. So first we will listen to a presentation by Lisa, and then we will open up for questions and reflections. So with no further ado, I present to you Lisa Goldmark. Right. Um, thank you very much, Donna, for the um, kind and very nice uh, introduction and also for the invitation to lecture. Um, today, uh, I will employ a metaphorical bird's eye view or rather a human metaphorical bird's eye view and initially uh, position ourselves uh, at planet Earth and time-wise in the Anthropocene, the word uh, deriving from the Greek language anthropo man and Kano's new or recent, the new age, the recent age of man, suggested respectively by American biologist Dean Crutzen, starting about uh, 1800, uh, during which, um, and sorry, um, also the biologist E. Stermer, and he's a meteorologist. Um, and Nobel Prize winner in chemistry. So they were actually two people uh, coining this word. Uh, and they implied the, um, this uh, time period to start at uh, 800 BC, during which humanity has been a significant factor in the change in the Earth's geology, climate, and ecosystem. And this to the extent that it can be read by geologists through the layers in the Earth's crust. And, um, Proposition accepted, the Anthropocene replaces the Holocene, commencing 5,000 years or more before the oldest striking system, the Sumerian cuneiform and the Egyptian hieroglyphs. And this factor of human-induced change, increased algae bloom, glaciers melting, sea levels rising, forests shrinking, oceans being polluted, all of which leads to heat waves, forest fires, floods, erosions, hurricanes, is nowadays, as we know, verified by the scientific community. And after some delay, uh, also acknowledged in the media by increased um, coverage. An early scientific report, an alarm signal about the state of affairs uh, was the Limits to Growth report from 1971 by Donella Meadows and her research team at MIT 
uh, stating that if business as usual is allowed to continue, there will be hardly any natural resources left to exploit by the year 2070. And calculated from today, this uh, would mean 50 to 100 years of coal and phosphorus, 50 years of natural gas, 40 years of oil, and only 17 years of fresh water. However, long before this report was published, environmental groups, thinkers and writers and indigenous peoples on all continents had voiced resistance to the ongoing exploitation of biomass, the pollution and emissions, um, which was then called the greenhouse effect. And this being highlighted by the presence of environmental activists protesting and supporting the first United Nations Conference on the Human Environment held in Stockholm in 1972. Uh, and now more than four decades later in 2015, the Paris Climate Agreement COP25 set the goal to maximum two degrees temperature increase by 2050, preferably 1.5. Uh, however, the current greenhouse gas emissions trend for the future is in perfect line with a temperature rise of six degrees. And if we were able to stay with the current emissions, we would be heading for three degrees, either of them not being a viable future for the planet. Meanwhile, the world's population is expected to increase to 9.8 billion by 2050 in fearing a need to produce 70% more food by that year. And greenhouse gas emissions here in Sweden, including the import of consumer goods, is about nine tons per person, implying a total consumption as if there existed 4.2 Earths. Uh, with food accounting for the largest part, 32% of Sweden's ecological footprint. Uh, Swedish climate law says emissions should be down to zero by 2045. However, to stay below 1.5 degrees warming, counting from 1850, and not risking self-generated heating, the end date for climate emissions and pollution um, must settle on zero by uh, 2030. Uh, and while um, the global threat of depleted resources and overheating is beginning to dawn upon us. Um, democratic values and practice are uh, becoming increasingly threatened. The last decade showing a worldwide crisis for freedom of speech and expression, um, activists, dissidents and minority groups being persecuted, uh, not least in Europe. However, last year, 2021, Sweden celebrated its centenary of universal and equal suffrage. Uh, the year uh, of 1921, when the category of women won the right to vote in parliamentary elections. Simultaneously, uh, a political and philosophical debate emerged in response to the Anthropocene and its implications, posing the question, will democracy as a ruling system be able to manage the climate crisis? And my intention today in this uh, lecture is to present a critical perspective of Western political history uh, panorama and using Sweden as an example. Why is the Anthropocene rather the an Anthro Anthropocene and how may democracy be strengthened and the planetary crisis be decreased by considering its exclusions, including the non-human in society and nature? And uh, firstly, we will go back in history uh, with the Greek word demos for people and kratin for regime, uh, finding that formal democracy can be said to have started some 2,500 years ago in ancient Greece with political reforms introduced by Solon and later Cleisthenes and then Pericles applying direct democracy in the resp respective city-states of Athens and uh, Sparta. However, the practice of democracy can be said to have existed long before the Greek reforms and at various places globally, for instance, in prehistorical indigenous communities in Polynesia, where the people sustaining themselves mainly on plant based diets, not having to use weapons and hunt animals, like many other communities, shared all the burdens, including the babysitting. 
However, uh, what is remarkable about the Greek city-states is that the values of democracy were written down, namely the values of isagoria, freedom of speech, and isonomia, equality before the law, based upon the philosophy of equivalence and joint decision-making. And the literary aspect of the Greek introduction of equality is an advantage in history as we usually um, uh, read the documents. And it gives us a clue as to which extent these states practiced democracy. Who consisted of the demos, the people, the citizens who held the right to vote in the city square, the agora in ancient Athens and Sparta? who were afforded with the means to be educated, reflect, read, and write. Well, um, the, re the prerequisites for attaining citizenship were as follows. You had to be a local, born there in the center. You had to be categorized as a male with an exterior and mental capacity that did not diverge from the men who already were citizens. Uh, you had to be an adult and you had to be a free man, not a slave. You had to own land and thus be in possession of resources. So if you instead were categorized as a woman or not categorized as a man, or if you were categorized as an immigrant or a slave or a worker without land or resources, or if you were in Athens under 20 years old and in Sparta under 30 years old, you were not a citizen with the right to speak and vote at the Agora Square. And this implies that about 30% of the population were ascribed citizenship with 1% exerting the most influence. And uh, the limited representation in Athens and Sparta mirrors the fact that both city-states were slave societies. And this kind of democracy with its combination of slavery and circumscribed equality lasted 200 years and it would take Europe a long time to again question in large scale action, the criteria of citizenship and also feudalism, oligarchy and monarchy. And it was not before um, the end of the 18th century that the American revolution followed by the French revolution uh, put forward uh, that all men are created equal. Tous les hommes sont égaux, et liberté, égalité, fraternité. However, the interpretation of this moral truth comprised the implicit notion that from antiquity, that the human referred to is a male being. Uh, and this is a perception of humanity that was um, daringly disclosed by the revolutionary proto-feminist -femin and anti um, slavery playwright Olympe de Gouges in her Declaration of the Rights of Women from uh, 1791. However, concerning uh, other issues, the French Revolution proved to be magnificently radical. For instance, feudalism was eradicated, the masculinity criterion to citizenship was extended beyond wealth, Jewish men were accepted as active citizens, the slave trade, uh, and slavery um, were abolished and the law against sodomy was abolished. And there were even marginal discussions about animal liberation. Lamentably, people in the women's category, half of humanity, half of the people continued to be uh, excluded and were eventually even barred from politics, not allowed to form associations and not allowed to speak in political forums. And hardly surprising then, in just a few years, the Republic derailed and was overthrown by the dictator Napoleon, who quickly erased the radical reforms of the French Revolution. So um, in the late 1880s, many groups in Western societies, together making up the majority of the people, were becoming aware that they were not included in decision making and did not have a voice that counted. And this popular propaganda image created in that time was widely disseminated in Europe and other parts of the world and can be seen as um, summarizing a critique of how society at the time and on the whole uh, was structured and how societies 
asymmetrical order um, contradicts the fact that we are all essentially and naturally of the same worth. And people are born uh, equal, uh, but live in classes of inequality and are formally and informally discriminated against. Hence, at the height of the Industrial Revolution uh, during late 19th century and also in the 20th century, we see more and more organized and educated protests and uprisings against the resource concentration of the few. And I will return to this image in, uh, later in the lecture. However, we may think for a bit about which groups are missing in this revealing but simplified drawing. Are people on the different planes equal? And which groups and dimensions are missing? Right. Uh, formal democracy expanded with an increasing number of groups gaining recognition and full citizenship. For instance, the human slavery system was abolished in England 1807 and in Sweden some years after in 1815 and in the US 50 years later due to the ingrained racism, the struggle being forced to continue up to the passing of the Voting Rights Act in 1965 and as we know being forced to continue today. Um, by 1909, against the backdrop of revolutions and workers' struggles in, for example, Russia, and not least, the suffrage campaigns for women's independence in Great Britain and other countries, most adult men gained the vote in Sweden. However, rejected also among adult, adult men were, for instance, uh, conscription dissenters, prison inmates, recipients of poor support, uh, not gaining the right to vote until 1937 and uh, 1945. And people who were incapacitated mentally received the right in 1989. Swedish Roma people and the indigenous Sápmi people gained voting rights in 1921, however, not in practice. That was a struggle that remained. Um, and in 1909, half of humanity in Sweden was still formally barred from full citizenship on the grounds of gender, regardless of identity and social class. Um, following a century long struggle for the franchise, the female category, though with the mentioned exceptions, uh, did win the vote and also gain majority in marriage 1921. And the decision having been preceded by 40 voted down parliamentary motions between 18, 1885 and 1917. And although women over the age of 23 were at last enfranchised, the women category continued to be discriminated against in terms of equal rights to education, academic careers, uh, variation, evaluation of skills, rights in the workplace, women earning only half the salary or less if employed, and no salary when working in the home, and domestic violence not yet being a um, parliamentary political issue. So, um, when the majority in the categories of adult men and adult women had won equal suffrage rights, political democracy as a state ruling system in Sweden was perceived to be in the dock. However, numerous uh, minority groups and dimensions remained to be recognized, uh, which is why we see continuing and increasing efforts of in no particular order. The labor movement, the movement of temperance, of free church, of women feminism, of trade unions, of the environment, of gays and the non-binary, of anti-racism and the struggle against anti-Semitism and the struggle against anti-Siganism, of the solidarity movement, of the rights of children, of the struggle against ableism and the struggle against uh, of struggle of refugees, of seniors and uh, the elderly against ageism, and of the animal rights movement. And the struggle of social movements aims to press for political and economic action to expand and deepen democratic values and processes, uh, incorporating groups and dimensions that are not yet or not fully considered in decision making. Activists all over the world historically and today are, however, subjected to repress repressive measures such as smear campaigns and the risk of being vilified and harassed. 
uh, according to the statistics of Global Witness and Amnesty International, 300 human rights uh, defenders were murdered in such persecutions in um, 2019. And violence against environmentalists has increased, showing an average of three to four activists, activists murdered uh, each week, which is four times more than 20 years ago. And nearly half of these activists belong to indigenous peoples. Uh, living in areas stricken by, and by environmental um, degradation. So after a long struggle, social movements may receive support from, from um, opinion and state, whereby democratic development is created. And laws and regula regulations may come about as a result of the awareness building of social movements. And when, when this happens, laws contribute to change. And the Swedish Discrimination Act uh, aims to counteract discrimination and promote equal rights and opportunities. Quote, regardless of gender, gender identity or expression, ethnicity, religion or other beliefs, disability, sexual orientation or age, end quote. However, we must note that in this law and in the Convention on the Rights of Children, economic situation is missing. Uh, however, this dimension is somewhat included uh, in the Convention of the European Union stating, quote, any discrimination based on any grounds such as sex, race, color, ethnic or social origin, right? Genetic features, language, religion or belief, political or any other opinion, membership of a national minority, property, Birth, disability, age, or sexual orientation shall be prohibited. End quote. Other groups which remain to be included are, for instance, uh, future generations and a group and dimension almost always overlooked. And here we get to the heart of the matter of this lecture, namely non humans. And here, uh, we see the widely spread popular image from the late 19th century that we saw before, uh, now with a modern touch and including non-humans found on the most subordinated plane, present as a large number of what used to be called uh, beasts of burden, uh, was, uh, um, but in actuality was and is animal slaves in human society. Uh, entirely alienated with small possibilities to escape, uh, deployed historically toiling in mills, breweries, coal mines, on the fields, in the forests, as means of transport in the countryside and in the cities, and today primarily as bodies to be uh, slaughtered in the large-scale production and consumption of foodstuffs. Uh, indeed, hierarchical oppression is visible in the laws throughout history in Europe, from antiquity to the 20th century, uh, the formal family system uh, reflecting society and uh, vice versa, with the husband, regardless of other identity, uh, standing as the legal head of the family and the wife as an underling without equal rights. And whomever defies the lawful master in the family, well then legal domestic social violence threatens. And in this historical family scheme, uh, the performance of oppression and killing uh, of the farm animals constituted an, an implicit warning, demonstrating what may follow also for the other subordinated. And the meat from animals presented at the dinner table comprised the real result and the symbol of this or hierarchy, uh, functioning also as a tasty bribe for the order, telling family members to eat and comply. Thus, we may discern a behavioral ideal. Since human and um, active uh, citizens in Western political history has been the same as man, and man historically was associated with killing or commanding to kill, uh, beginning in the obtaining of dead flesh as food in hunting and in slaughter. A power model evolved, engaging humans of no power or much less power, making them perform the actual warfare and enslavement, 
regarding animals to producing, breeding, transporting, slaughtering, preparing, cooking, serving. And in this way, a food ideal was created where protein from killed non-humans is conceived to be the full-fledged food for the full-fledged human, the ideal way to sustain the ideal human being. Uh, and in this uh, societal scheme, the most oppressed beings are the non-humans making up the material base for the social order. So uh, from master in the home and master in the state to mass production, the human non-human relationship in general has remained characterized by the abuse of power today of a magnitude never before seen in human history. And the system involves confinement from birth, rape, the standard term in the industry being the rape rack, the deprivation of offspring and premature death. That is, beings with body and brain, mental life, are perceived uh, to be substances or entities with feelings of no significance uh, who may become things for consumption. And this relationship and its fierce character is yet to be recognized in the political deba debate, uh, despite the fact that historically, cruelty to animals was a pressing issue already in the early abolitionist movement, and especially the women's movement, when full citizenship and rights were withheld from people in the category of women in Europe and the US, women were welcomed in the animal rights or animal protection movements as leaders and on steering committees, educating other women in democratic processes and public speaking to win the suffrage and make laws against, for instance, domestic abuse. And in fact, it was common for both the law abiding suffragists and the law breaking suffragettes, including the civil disobedience uh, flank, uh, to be vegetarians and aware of the oppression of animals in society and within the family. Yes, the humanity's general relationship with non humans and its character of violence is seldom criticized. Oftentimes, non human relationships are not recognized at all. And this, although nature constitutes humanity's living conditions, the way we obtain oxygen, fresh water, farm food, the trees, the ground, the water, the animals fertilizing, pollinating, loosening the soil, were and are the very prerequisites for human and non human existence. And ignorance about these basic facts is, I would say, surprisingly often a significant reason as to why the relationship um, to the non human is still. Uh, generally ignored even in today's um, democracies. Now, beginning with the onset of industrialized slaughterhouses in the 1870s in the US and Europe, um, the destructive relationship spread globally. According to the uh, 13th edition of the World Wildlife uh, Fund's publication, the Living Planet Index, there is now a 68% uh, average decline in global vertebrate species populations between 1970 and 2016. Quote, the main cause of the dramatic decline in species populations in, on land observed in the index is habitat loss and degradation, including deforestation, driven by how we as humanity produce food, end quote. And thus here the organization acknowledged the vicious circle of the catastrophe, namely that the mass killing of non-humans in society is driving the sixth mass extinction in nature, a predicament even worse than climate change. Um, yes, the consequences of the relationship are today being examined in the scientific community at last, which is an immensely positive development and a concrete result of the struggles of social movements. Um, significant investigations beginning in 1992 with the World Watch Institute report, followed in uh, uh, 2006 by the uh, FIA, FAO report, the livestock's long shadow, followed by the environmental program of the uh, UN, 
uh, in June 2010, stating um, that the two most important problems the world faces are the usage of fossil fuels, as we all know, and agriculture's focus on animal production, followed by the study published in Nature in October 2018, calling for the Western countries to reduce meat consumption by 90% and poultry and milk by 60%, replacing it with pulses and beans um, to keep the food system within environmental limits. And uh, not least, a study from the University of Oxford in 2018 showing that meat and dairy products take up 83% of the world's farmland, but pro provide only 18% of calories and 37% of proteins. And the study found without the production of meat and milk, 75% of the farmland would be set free. And uh, these reports uh, suggest us to remind ourselves of the huge difference in general between animal protein production and plant protein production. And I will run them through as I perceive them. Uh, the contribution to animal cruelty, abuse, the mass killing, slaughter of animals, daily working conditions for the workers, having to kill beings on an assembly line, thus risking uh, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, deforestation and fires, land shortage, erosion, air pollution, eutrophication, climate gases, freshwater shortages, reduced biodiversity, zoonosis, um, pandemics such as the current COVID-19, antibiotic resistance, cancer and multiple health risks, natural disasters, conflicts, destruction of livelihood, leading to forced migration, over 80 million people currently being displaced due to climate change and conflicts, uh, deaths and deficits as state and world economies subsidize um, uh, environmentally harmful animal agriculture with $470 billion yearly. Uh, and overall, uh, one may uh, state that the environmental and economic costs are um, to some extent being uh, acknowledged in the scientific community and by the UN, of course, uh, but that insights and assessments of the social costs are lagging behind. And plant-based protein production would, of course, not solve all problems, uh, yet it would imply liberation from societal domestic industrial violence and liberation from the stress of having to repress facts about this violence. Uh, thus, as I see it, um, the problem is structural. Meat normativity is one way to understand why society has not yet acknowledged the relationship to, to non-humans and why it does not comprehend its general destructive character. Meat normativity being the institutions, structures, relationships and actions which perpetuates the norm ideology of other animals as living objects for man to produce and consume as everyday meat where meat is presented as the only natural, indispensable and normal protein food for humans, symbol and real result, not only of traditional elite human power, but also of civilization. And eventually when this normativity spread from the Northern hemisphere with a five fold increase in production since 1950 as an indicator of modernity. Meat normativity may be interpreted as dialectically linked to anthropocentrism, uh, the notion that everything in the world exists for the benefit of humanity. Anthropocentrism harboring a fundamental ontological notion that humanity exists in contrast to animals, a notion which cannot be easily contended since humanity already belongs to the group. And since all humans are human animals, to the very same extent. In fact, our common denominator is our kinship with animals, humanity being a very special and incommensurable member of Metasoa. And in the wake of economical investments in meat normativity, 
founded as it is in the ancient belief, false belief, that human survival requires dominance, killing and extinction, a culture of silence has ensued, testifying to uh, John Stuart Mill's observed additional level of censor, prevailing public opinion as social tyranny, implying intolerance against deviant feelings and opinions, and thus silencing debate. And today, this culture of silence appears as, uh, I would say, a fact persistence and denial in relation to meat normativity. And these responses explain why um, human violence uh, toward non-humans is not yet seen as violence and why the following basic question is seldom or never posed in research and debate. Um, what are the consequences of society's relationship to the animal category in history and which are the effects today? Um, right, the original image of hierarchy from the 1880s depicting Western white uh, colonial patriarchal society, I would say, is foremost today of relevance globally. Just as women were not acknowledged as citizens in the early Greek democracies and not as active citizens during the French Revolution, and just as women and other groups were excluded during um, the 20th century, today there are people groups and dimensions who are involved and affected by democratic decisions, um, for example in Sweden, yet are not taken into consideration. Um, peripheral producers in other societies, workers on other continents, producing consumer goods which exported and imported amounts to in the case of Sweden, 90% of the country's consumption. Most of the workers uh, who produce these uh, goods uh, belong to the category of women, young and old, women being overrepresented also among workers who get low salaries and no salaries performing three fourths of all unpaid work in the world on top of their uh, regular workload, thus having to endure the harshest living conditions. In fact, 1% of humanity, the same percentage and with the same characteristics as in antiquity in the Greek city-states, uh, have more, 1% uh, of humanity, have more than double the wealth of 6.9 billion people with half the world's population living on $550 a day, according to the statistics of Oxfam in 2020. Indigenous people, 5% of the world population living in areas which make them protectors of 80% of the world's biodiversity. Migrants and refugees being uh, displaced, seeking livelihood due to environmental damage, uh, nature catastrophes and uh, ensuing conflicts. Future generations who will have to manage uh, accumulated problems caused by earlier generations such as ours. And the scant consideration of these exclusions, all negatively affected by the current exploitation of the last mentioned, that is animals and nature, nature, is an important reason as to why there exists a planetary crisis, making it pivotal to ask how excluded groups and dimensions may be represented in democracy. Indeed, appropriate inclusions are necessary to make climate and environmental problems surface so that they may be counted, managed and resolved. So beginning in Athens and Sparta uh, and also in the 20th century, a person has had to be categorized as belonging to a certain uh, species, a certain social class, a certain exterior body and mental capacity, and a certain age to be qualified for respect, personhood, citizenship, and or decision making. Which is why when we talk of the human or humanity in political history, we are actually not talking about humanity. We are talking about the perception of humanity, that is the specific ideal of the human the traditional minority in power. 
Thus, on closer inspection, anthropocentrism is rather anthro anthropocentrism, characterized by the historical power of ideal fulfilling humans from the center. And this historically traceable perception and reality um, explains the struggles of social movements to gain recognition and participation in democracy. And uh, one philosophical option debated in recent years is posthumanism, um, reflecting the evolutionary truth that uh, humanity exists as one species among many species on the planet, a member of the greater family of Metazoa. Um, however, this fact is often also taken to imply that we are, uh, as, a humanity, as a humanity, all a member in humanity, in all respects equal with non-humans, and that the stark boundary between humans and non-humans exists only to protect privileges. Uh, such a view disregards that in terms of power, there is no equality between humans and non-humans, as humans in general are endowed with uh, incomparably greater capacity to act creatively and to act destructively. And this general power of humanity is very special and not equal to non-humans, but instead, instead make human societies uniquely responsible in relation to non-humans. Human societies mismanagement of their own action capacity, that is, I argue, anthro-anthropocentrism, has propelled us into the anthro-anthropocene. However, luckily, there are more viable options for instance, uh, the historically overlooked alternative of feminist humanism. Uh, that would be endeavoring towards a self-reflective relational examining of one's own behavior and one's society or group's behavior, recognizing positions of power, whomever is affected by one's action, comprehending that nature as Jot Kaprotkin once pointed out in his book, Mutual Aid, um, nature comprises empathy, altruism, and cooperation, however, unavoidably and tragically uh, contains systematic predation, and that humanity, with its specific station of accountable power, therefore never should deploy nature as if it were a blueprint socially but instead recognize nature's rich diversity while respectfully managing its laws and limitations. Uh, Henry Beston wrote in The Outermost House, A Year of Life on the Great Beach uh, of Cape Cod. Um, we patronize them for their incompleteness, for their tragic fate of having taken form so far below ourselves. And therein we err, and greatly err, for the animal shall not be measured by man. In a world older and more complete than ours, they move finished and complete, gifted with extensions of the senses we have lost or never attained, living by voices we shall never hear. They are not brethren, they are not underlings, they are other nations, caught with ourselves in the net of life and time, fellow prisoners of the splendor and travail of the earth." End quote. Undoubtedly, there is truth in these insightful, self-critical lines from 1928. However, considering the situation of today, one must emphasize uh, the mobile character of animal nations, if you will, uh, ranging from, for instance, moose migrations across borders, to robins and cranes migrating back and forth between the Nordic countries and North Africa. Um, by facing the facts um, of the prevailing exploitation of non-humans, uh, observing and measuring the dire consequences, a surprising and wonderful context emerges, namely the possibility that bestowing rights upon non-humans may save humanity from the route to self-destruction. However, for this to happen, the category of animals needs to be recognized in the constitution, not only as migrating nations, 
but also as comprising of sentient planetary citizens with interests. Living, feeling, next of kin, with the right to be protected rather than owned and traded. And such a change would open for the abolition of the trade in animal bodies, enabling the product of animal meat to be acknowledged as the health hazard it has proven to be, so that it could in like manner to the UK banning of the sale of petrol and diesel cars by 2030, be replaced by safer protein products on the food market. And such reforms may be democratically introduced also in view of the fact that the meat trade is the main source of the current and future pandemics. And in view of the fact that plant-based diets present us with the opportunity to reduce the risk of getting severely ill in COVID-19 with 73%, according to a recent study in British Medical Journal. Furthermore, satisfying the urgent need for respectfully implemented and subsidized reforms in, the, in this direction uh, would make it possible to add a since long missing paragraph to the UN Declaration of Human Rights, namely the human right to abstain from killing. And this was inspired uh, by the author Svetlana Alexeyevich, uh, Nobel Laureate in Literature 2015. Uh, over the past century, Western society has increased its economic productivity enormously. However, it has not as much increased its sharing capacity and its capacity to protect everybody's chance for survival. And to amend this undervalued dimension of democracy, the sharing of resources, one may inspect the fair share, the ancient Greek art cup, also known as the cup of greed, or the cup of justice. The drink cup attributed to Pythagoras of Samos, who was a vegetarian, by the way, emptying itself by a mirage effect when it is filled above a certain level, causing the contents to run out through a hole in the bottom to a receiver at a lower level. The transfer taking place without a pump due to the hydrostatic uh, pressure that occurs. And yes, this is how one may choose to uh, choose from, from nature wisely. Likewise, societies and companies and uh, individuals who may find themselves filled up with more than their share may get inspired to share with others, perhaps guided by democratically decided consumption and production emission quotas. And as importantly, government budget costs may start to include biomass usage and emissions so that the depth to nature the very content of the cup becomes visible economically. Right, now time to round off. Uh, I have argued that democracy as a value decision and sharing system needs to continue to expand and reflect more groups and dimensions, thereby also increasing the chances of humanity to manage the material, social and existential crisis. And rather than placing power and trust in a few, being largely the fundamental mistake of European history resulting in the prevailing crisis, human societies must continuously ask who and what is affected by the decisions. Has everyone and everything which ought to and needs to be included been included? And the recent pandemic shows that it is possible for us humans to understand when the situation is alarming and that we are able to adapt our habits and behavior accordingly. And this experience makes our time in history an excellent moment to put the facts forward and call for a conversion of the non-human relationship in order to safeguard and develop democracy. Thank you uh, ever so much for listening so patiently.